Greetings ladies and gentlemen, it's Jinzo here. As the title suggests, today's video will be on the history of Dota 2 and consequently the history of the MOBA genre itself. The motive of this video was fairly straightforward to me, as on YouTube there exists an overwhelming number of miracle replays. And don't get me wrong, I do believe that professional Dota 2 players should be getting the recognition they rightly deserve. However, I can't help but feel that the original content developers of Dota are not receiving enough credit for the sheer magnitude of their achievement, especially a certain special individual, he who shall not be named. Here's a hint though, his online alias refers to an amphibian on ice. Jokes aside, I will be taking this opportunity to discuss the development of the MOBA genre and also of Dota itself over the past decade and a half. So, without further ado, let us begin. To begin with, we must first define what is meant by the term MOBA. MOBA is an acronym that stands for Multiplayer Online Battle Arena, also known as an Action Real-Time Strategy Game, or an ARTS for short. Now, our story begins in 1998 with a game called StarCraft, developed by Blizzard Entertainment. As you're probably aware already, StarCraft was an RTS game. The story focused on the conflict between three species in part of our Milky Way, also known as the Koprulu Sector, at the beginning of the 26th century BC. However, it wasn't its compelling narrative that gave StarCraft its popularity. It was the precise gameplay mechanics, the uncompromising competitiveness that defines StarCraft as the RTS game truest to its genre. StarCraft pitched players and their associated army against each other, and the win condition was rather straightforward. The last man standing wins. Unfortunately, despite StarCraft's success as an eSport, there was still one small problem with the game. Despite its rewarding nature, it was never the most accessible game to your average gaming audience. As most online RTS players are aware, the online ladder is rather intimidating Luckily though, players were able to create their own custom maps for the game, and one of those custom maps was a game called Eon of Strife, created by a player under the alias of Eon64. In Eon of Strife, a player would control a single powerful hero unit to fight against AI-controlled enemies in one of three lanes. Originally, there were only eight playable hero units, without any special abilities that we are familiar with today, and currency accumulated in the game would be spent on weapons and armor upgrades. Not only that, but leveling didn't really exist back then. The only thing that really mattered was how many upgrades you had purchased from the shop, and like modern MOBAs, the aim was to destroy the enemy's core, which back then was represented by a Zelnaga temple. Now, if you're wondering where the map name came from, it was from this. The Eon of Strife was a civil war between the Protoss race, and earned the status of the bloodiest, most violent civil war ever recorded in galactic history, and lasted for thousands of years in the StarCraft universe. And this took place on the planet Aya. Unfortunately, as epic as the battle was in the fictional universe, Eon of Strife did not gain that much popularity in the community, despite its potential as an innovator for future games to come. The story of course doesn't end there as we fast forward a few years to the release of Warcraft 3, The Reign of Chaos in 2002. Warcraft 3, like Starcraft before it, was also an RTS game. Other than the obvious aesthetic differences between the two games, Warcraft 3 was slightly more accessible due to the game revolving around the newly introduced hero progression system, and as expected, Blizzard included a free world editor in the game that allowed players to create custom scenarios or maps which could be played online with other players through Battle.net. These custom scenarios can be simple terrain changes, which often play out like ordinary Warcraft games. Or they could be completely different game scenarios with custom objectives, units, items and events, which meant that if the player wanted, it was possible to create a custom campaign mode. With these tools, a modder by the name of Yule, the holder of the first Scepter of Divinity, began development on a similar map to Eon of Strife that would support up to 10 players, which he called Defense of the Ancients, or Dota for short. This was where the RPG elements were further refined. 
The core gameplay of the game remained much the same. RTS style point and click control of a single powerful unit, but now these heroes controlled wildly different abilities and could purchase different weapons and would be able to level up gaining even more skills at their disposal. Killing opposing heroes and AI creep units would reward a player with both experience and gold. And of course, when a hero was defeated there would be a respawn timer which in turn gave the opposing team an advantage in lane pushing as expected. Yule spent a year refining the original Dota map until Warcraft 3, the Frozen Throne expansion, was released in 2003. Along with the Frozen Throne also came a more advanced world editor. Yule used this and made a new version of Dota called Dota 2, Thirst for Gamma. Unfortunately, it wasn't successful in replacing the original Dota that had also been ported into the Frozen Throne. Sadly, soon after this, Yule vanished, but not before making his work open source. With this, other map makers started producing spin-offs of the original Dota, and added in new heroes, items, and various new features. These maps went back and forth for a while until early 2003. Eventually, two modders by the name of Mayan and Ragnar compiled a particularly fun-to-play version of Dota named Dota All-Stars. The historical reason for why the term All-Stars was added to the Dota name was because this version of Dota included various heroes from all the different versions of Dota which existed at the time. The very first version of the All-Stars series was called Dota All-Stars Beta version 0.95 released on February 3rd, 2004. This was a cornerstone in the history of Dota, as in the development of later versions, the All-Star series was generally accepted by the community as the best version of Dota. And as one would expect, the All-Star series eventually became more balanced and refined with more heroes added over time. However, just one month later, Ginsu, the bearer of the first Scythe of Ice, came into the scene. Ginsu took control of the development and began the 3x to 5x series of Dota All-Stars. In March 2004, All-Stars version 3.0D was released, and a further month later, version 4.0 was introduced. In version 4.0, it was the first map to feature Roshan as we know today, which was interestingly enough named after Ginsu's bowling ball. Ginsu meticulously developed Dota All-Stars, combining the best elements of various Dota mods while simultaneously adding in his own original content. Eventually, All-Stars featured a map filled with neutral creatures, today known as the Jungle. In addition, it boasted many heroes and had an overwhelming number of viable items, some of which could be combined with a new mechanic called Recipes, which still exists in Dota 2 even today. Ginsu was soon joined by Pendragon. Pendragon built the forum that eventually became the backbone of the Dota All-Stars community, allowing players to communicate with one another, arrange games, and perhaps most importantly, to provide feedback on the game's balance and future development. Dota All-Stars continues to surge in popularity, and in November 2004, Dota All-Stars version 5.84 was released by Ginsu, and this was the first competitive version of Dota ever to be released. Unfortunately, in early 2005, shortly after the release of the 6X series of Dota All-Stars, Ginsu announces his departure and Icefrog, along with Nakus, takes over development. Nakus was the head developer for quite some time, and interestingly enough, his relative obscurity from the history of Dota is due to the fact that he never put his name on the map. He simply changed it from Ginsu's Dota to Dota All-Stars. Nakus spent a lot of time developing and updating heroes, changing them dramatically. Not only that, but Nakus created many of the heroes completely by himself, such as Axe, Pudge, Sand King, Morphling, Phantom Lancer, Ricky Maru, Ursa Warrior, Broodmother, Weaver, Shadowfiend, Enchantress, and many, many more. Oh, and the concept of the Courier was also his idea. Unfortunately, many months later, Nakus had lost interest in being the lead developer and handed the project over to Icefrog. Due to Dota version 5.84 being so well received, many fans refused to accept the huge changes started by the 6X series of Dota All-Stars. This meant that the earlier versions of the 6X series wasn't so popular among the fans. However, Icefrog wasn't going to give up that easily. 
Inspired by the intricate balance of StarCraft and WarCraft 3, Icefrog endlessly tweaked the balance of the heroes and their associated item builds. Icefrog continued to focus on the finer details in an attempt to create a perfectly precise and balanced competitive experience. No combination of heroes or items should outweigh any other, no attribute should become too powerful. And with that, in November 2005, Dota All-Stars version 6.27 was released by Icefrog, the second competitive version, and was loved by the fans. Meanwhile, as Dota surged with a growing fanbase, came along with it various problems. Regardless of how popular the game may be, it was still just a mod for Warcraft 3. This meant that external clients had to be used for matchmaking and communication between players. But that wasn't the worst of it. The worst part was that the future development of Dota was fundamentally limited by the Warcraft engine. And even with all those limitations, by 2008, the popularity of Dota had attracted commercial attention. That year, the Casual Collective released a title called Minions, a Flash web mobile game. And Gas Powered Games also released the first standalone commercial title in the mobile genre called Demigod. Unfortunately, some MOBAs, such as these, could never capture the true essence of what made Dota a great game. Meanwhile, Ginsu and Pendragon, along with Ryze and Trundamir, founded the company called Riot Games, and this was where League of Legends was born. League of Legends was released on October 27th, 2009, and was the first true competitor to Dota All-Stars. And around this time, Valve's interest in the defense of the Ancients grew when several veteran employees of the company, including Team Fortress's designer, became fans of the mod. Then Valve corresponded with Icefrog regarding his long-term plans for Dota, and he was subsequently hired to create a sequel to Dota All-Stars. Icefrog then announced his new role through his website in October of 2009, Valve then adopted the word Dota, derived from the mod's original acronym as the name for its newly acquired franchise. Exactly one year later, in October of 2010, Dota 2 was announced. Shortly after the announcement of Dota 2, Valve filed a trademark claim to the Dota name. Unsurprisingly, Blizzard then filed an opposing trademark for Dota, stating that the Dota name belonged to the mod's community citing Blizzard's ownership of both Warcraft 3 World Editor and Dota All-Stars. The dispute was settled in May 2012, with Valve retaining commercial franchise rights to the Dota brand. And despite Dota 2 being playable in beta from 2011, Dota 2, the true sequel to Dota All-Stars, was officially released in July of 2013. Just two months following the game's release, Gabe Newell claimed that updates to Dota 2 generated up to 3% of global internet traffic, and in December 2013, the final restrictions against unlimited global access to Dota 2 were lifted after the game's infrastructure and servers were substantially improved. And of course, it doesn't end quite there. To showcase the game's true capabilities, Valve sponsors 16 accomplished Defense of the Ancients teams to compete at the International each year, a Dota 2 specific esports tournament for a large multi million prize pool. Since Dota 2's release in 2011, there have been six internationals in total. Combined, professional Dota 2 tournaments have earned teams and players over $65 million in prize money by 2016, which is substantially more than any other video game in esports history. And it's on this note that our brief Dota 2 lesson ends for now. However, before I end this video, I would just like to say one quick thing. I know that I am a small YouTuber, but there is a tiny but finite probability that one of the original developers of Dota may watch this video one day. And it's up to you and me now to join together in a chorus to say from the bottom of our hearts, thank you. Not just because you have created a great game, but you have changed the course of video game history forever. You didn't create Dota All-Stars for commercial reasons, like companies today would do. You did it purely for the love of the game, and that is a trait which is hard to come by, especially in today's gaming industry. And with that is the final conclusion to this video, and as always, my name is Jinzo, and it was my pleasure to be your host today. 
If you like this video, please throw a like, subscribe and leave a comment. Tell me what you agreed with and what you didn't agree with in this video. And in this video's description is the link to our Discord channel. Feel free to drop by for a chat and to ask me any questions you wish to ask and of course to play some casual Dota games if you so wish. So thank you for watching and until next time, Jinzo out.